Um, okay, I guess let's get started. Um, so welcome and thank you for joining us for this afternoon's panel, uh, How to Catch an Enabler, um, Routes to Accountability for Corruption's Professional Enablers. I'm going to start this panel by telling a story. In 2009, an 11-year-old boy became the landlord of a large commercial building in central London, just off the world-famous Regent Street. The building, which had been constructed only one year earlier, became home to a Michelin-starred restaurant, an art gallery, the publisher of uh, magazines like Vogue and Vanity Fair. The building was worth $49 million. But neither diners visiting the Michelin-starred restaurant nor pedestrians walking past the building's front door could have known that all of this was owned by a child. Officially, the building was owned by a company registered in the British Virgin Islands, who owned that company uh, was a secret. And so, for more than a decade, the building's ownership remained hidden to anyone who bothered to check. Three years ago, that all changed. Reporters at the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists got hold of leaked data from a company called Trident Trust. Trident Trust is an offshore trust and corporate services provider, a company which sets up and administers shell companies, trusts, and bank accounts uh, for its paying customers. It operates all around the world in what are often called secrecy jurisdictions, like the Bahamas, Jersey, and Mauritius. The journalists shared the Trident Trust data with us at the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project and several other media outlets. And Trident Trust, we learned when we started digging through the data, had been very busy in setting up dozens of companies in the British Virgin Islands. And collectively, it turned out, those uh, shell companies had bought up property in London uh, or elsewhere in the UK worth more, uh, nearly $700 million. And what connected all of these shell companies, we also learned, was that they were owned by some of the people uh, closest in the world to Ilham Aliyev, the dictatorial president of Azerbaijan. They included President Aliyev's two daughters, uh, his father-in-law, two of his closest uh, business associates, and his 11-year-old son. We published our findings in an investigation that became known as the Pandora Papers. Um, Ilham Aliyev has been president of Azerbaijan for the past 21 years, since 2003. Before that, his father, Haydar Aliyev, was president for 10 years. How members of the Aliyev family have amassed a fortune so vast that they can invest uh, into UK real estate worth $700 million is not something I will speculate on. But several of the shell companies they owned uh, received multi-million dollar cash injections from other shell companies, which were involved in vast money laundering systems and money transfer systems previously uncovered by reporters, including the Azerbaijani laundromat, the Russian laundromat, the Troika laundromat, and others. The ultimate origin of this money is unknown, and these systems have moved both legitimate and illegitimate funds. Um, another reporting has shown how shell companies created for President Aliyev's daughters in Panama, another secrecy jurisdiction, uh, were used to secretly uh, own a stake in a lucrative gold mine in Azerbaijan. The role in this story of Trident Trust, the corporate services provider um, uh, which set up the shell companies in the British Virgin Islands, uh, is an example of what we as reporters have uh, come to understand as enabling which is what we're here to discuss this afternoon. And traditionally, the professionals who help uh, execute corruption schemes have faced few consequences. But in recent years, uh, this has started to change. Uh, as journalists, civil society actors, and now government and law enforcement um, have more and more focused uh, on, on pursuing those who facilitate the flow of dubious funds. So in this panel, we'll be discussing the E-word, enablers, the professionals who help uh, bad actors uh, perpetrate acts of corruption and how they do it. Um, and we'll be considering uh, what steps the anti-corruption community can take to hold enablers to account so that serious offenders face repercussions. Um, the discussion will consider recent policy changes, regulatory developments, uh, uh, enforcement actions, and research and investigative reporting efforts. Uh, my name is Tom Stocks. I'm a journalist with the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. Uh, in recent years, OCCRP has published numerous uh, investigations which look at the role of enablers in various schemes, including corruption, money laundering, uh, sanctions evasion, and other crimes. And joining me for this discussion is a diverse uh, range of professionals with different areas of expertise uh, on the topic of anti-corruption and enablers. 
We have uh, Eka Rostomashvili, uh, Campaigns Lead at Transparency International, uh, a global campaign organization whose mission is to stop corruption and promote transparency, and is the host of this conference. Uh, transparency International has uh, been looking at the issue of enablers for, for many years, um, and increasingly has been looking at the role of uh, non-banking sector enablers, uh, so those who provide essential services but are outside of the banking system or sector. Um, uh, also joining me, we have uh, Chiara Bacci from the European Commission's uh, Financial Crime Unit, where she is team leader for anti-money laundering uh, and counter-financing of terrorism policy development. Um, the EU has very recently passed new measures uh, on tackling uh, money laundering uh, with the creation of the Anti-Money Laundering Authority, or AMLA, uh, a new EU, EU authority uh, which will coordinate national authorities uh, to ensure consistent application of uh, anti-money laundering rules across member states. Um, so we'll be looking forward to hearing from uh, Chiara uh, on more about those recent developments. Um, we also have uh, Kyriakos Lordanu, um, a general manager of the Institute of Certified Public Accountants of Cyprus, um, the competent authority in Cyprus which regulates accountants and auditors. Um, the Institute's mission is to empower its members with knowledge and training and to promote prof professional and ethical standards. And uh, finally, we have uh, Justina Gudzowska, um, Associate Fellow at the Royal United Services Institute, RUSI, um, a British defense and security think tank. Uh, RUSI recently uh, published a policy brief about professional enablers of sanctions evasion, um, and that report identifies typical methods and tools used by enablers uh, who facilitate uh, sanctions evasion and recommends policy, uh, what policymakers can do uh, to minimize their use in sanctions evasion schemes. Um, so we'll be hearing more uh, from Justina on uh, that uh, recent report, and if you haven't read it already, I highly recommend it. Um, so welcome to our panel, and just very briefly, the way this session will work is um, we'll have uh, the first half of the session, we'll, each of the speakers will uh, uh, present in turn on an area of their expertise as it relates to um, enablers of, of corruption, and in the second half we'll have a few more um, questions and discussion, and then open up to Q&A uh, from the audience. So if you do have any questions, um, please, uh, please uh, keep those back, and we'll have a chance to uh, ask them at the end. Um, Okay, so for my first question, I want to start with some definitions and terminology. Um, I'm going to turn to you, Eka. So Transparency International has been writing about uh, uh, enablers for years. So briefly, what do we need, mean when we uh, talk about enablers, uh, professional enablers? Who are they? Uh, what are they doing? Thank you, Tom. Uh, and indeed, we appreciate uh, Transparency International that enablers is a very loaded term and many professionals do not like it. Mm -hmm. So uh, first, let me start with the less controversial term, which is gatekeepers. Um, gatekeepers are those individuals and entities who, um, whom the money launderers and criminals and the corrupt individuals need to pass in order to succeed in laundering their money or investing their illicit gains. So they really are the first defense uh, against money laundering. Enablers uh, include those, uh, like you were mentioning, uh, actors who operate in the financial sector, like banks, wealth managers, virtual assets, uh, which, uh, virtual assets service providers, uh, and so on, and the non-financial, uh, as well as gatekeepers in the non-financial sector, whom we are increasingly uh, looking into at uh, Transparency International. And these gatekeepers, gatekeeper professions, uh, include lawyers, accountants, real estate agents, notaries, uh, and dealers in precious metals, and so on. Uh, historically, the non-financial uh, gatekeepers in the non-financial sector have been less uh, scrutinized, and it's actually really great that we're having uh, a chance to talk about uh, also um, them and uh, turn more attention to, to enablers, uh, specifically in, in, in the non-financial sector. Uh, be, and we want to do that because the services that they provide are really critical to the corrupt uh, individuals in executing their schemes, especially uh, when it comes to cross-border corruption uh, schemes. So gatekeepers are required and should be required by the international standards to conduct checks on their clients, to do due diligence on their clients, to identify beneficial owners and to uh, report a suspicious transaction reports. This is not the case in every country, and I think we'll get to that as well. Um, but beyond that, I think uh, many cases, including those reported by you, 
Uh, and here I also would like to give a shout out to the Global Anti-Corruption Consortium, which is our partnership with Transparency International and OCCRP are partnering as part of this um, very impactful and effective consortium for, for some years now, and Enablers was also an increasing area of focus for, the, for our work. But these cases, and as well as many others, ICAJ and so on, and also real-world cases investigated by the authorities have shown that gatekeepers do not always uh, perform their obligations uh, as they should, so this is when uh, they become enablers. Uh, and here also we should distinguish the terms professional enablers and enablers, a little bit more in a, a, a more loose term. Um, professional enable, enablers, uh, we refer to those who actively work with the, with the criminals and individuals who, who want to launder their money. Um, and um, often, yeah, they, 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 they use their skills uh, with kind of, uh, with the intent of supporting and helping them launder their money or invest their illicit gains. Uh, whereas enablers to us uh, also encompasses the category and the subset of the gatekeepers who may not know necessarily that they're aiding and uh, um, money laundering or, or um, financial crime, but they end up enabling because they fail to um, ask more questions, they take unnecessarily and, and unjustifiably high risks, or uh, there's also a scenario where, uh, as I mentioned earlier, not all countries subject the gatekeepers to these obligations. A gatekeeper might also be following the rules at the time in the country, and, but nevertheless enable uh, financial crime and uh, cross-border corruption. So these are who we uh, call enablers. And, and, what, and what is the uh, culpability for the type of enablers that you're talking about when you say those who are maybe negligent, who, who aren't actively trying to promote these corruption schemes, but, but are nevertheless letting it happen? How, how culpable are they in these corruption schemes? Yeah. This is a very important topic, and for us also, accountability of the enablers, this subset who, who, who appear and who, who use their, service, their skills and expertise to enable uh, cross-border corruption, willingly or unwillingly, is really, really important. Um, there's definitely criminal routes, right? And this is particularly difficult, and probably uh, this is something also that we will discuss, because in criminal cases you normally have to prove knowledge of, of uh, criminality and intent. Um, and uh, another important route is uh, so it is very difficult to build a case, and I think we heard from Mary Butler as well from uh, during a re the workshop on real estate transparency yesterday about how difficult it is to build cases uh, in against enablers. And there's also the regulatory route, um, and this is difficult and challenging in countries where enablers don't have anti-money laundering obligations or where supervision is ineffective and essentially they don't face uh, yeah, the checks that they should have. Um, and why is it important to hold uh, enablers to account? That's a good question as well. Um, so, uh, first, I think it's important for justice, right? So, when we uh, have cases where perpetrators of corruption, individuals who steal money, embezzle from, from you know, treasuries of their countries and commit grant corruption, which can also have serious human rights, um, can come with serious human rights violations, Enablers, as you also were mentioning earlier, often do not face uh, such consequences, so it's important also for justice because they provide services that cause a lot of harm in the societies where these services are delivered. Often this is abroad, and we'll also get to that. Um, another uh, reason, actually, is that and um, if, if you were attending the workshop on day one of the conference uh, that was organized by the US government on enablers, uh, we heard from the FBI representative who mentioned, who said that going after enablers is actually has been very effective in his work and in their work because it often allows them to get to the perpetrators who often remains hidden behind the companies that the enablers have set up. So this is also uh, a very important reason, especially because the same enablers will often be providing services to other dodgy individuals, other corrupt individuals. So this can really have a disruptive effect um, on, on the, for, for the issue. And uh, finally, I would just highlight that this can also serve as a deterrent, right? So it can, be a, can have a preventive uh, impact as well, especially if the sanctions and um, fines and penalties and so on are uh, proportionate and dissuasive. Uh, so it can, that can really disincentivize enabling behaviors on other gatekeepers' part. 
Um, and I mentioned at the start um, that the, you know, traditionally the, the focus hasn't been so much on enablers and that's kind of changed in the last few years. What do you think has, has, uh, has driven that, um, that focus to be more on going after the enablers now as well? I think um, we've, yeah, it's, it's, it's also not that we should forget the financial sector. I think there's like, everybody probably will agree that there still remains more uh, that needs to be done, including when it comes to accountability. Um, but uh, numerous cases have shown that they're not the only ones who, who provide their services uh, to, to the corrupt and criminals. And also, the, I guess, the realization that, that in many countries, these professions have been ignored for, for, for a very long time, and it's, the time has come to do so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I want to bring in you, Kyriakos. Um, so in your country, Cyprus, um, you know, your country has unfortunately become almost synonymous with concepts of illicit finance, particularly among you know, investigative journalism community uh, where I work. Um, why do you think that that is the case, um, particularly think, keeping in mind the, the idea of professional enablers, and do you think that's fair? Well, thank you, Trauma. Thanks for the invitation. It's always uh, more pleasant uh, for us coming from 45 degrees to a more reasonable <laughs> <laughs> climate. Um, well, you're, it's, it's true what you're saying. Uh, unfortunately, Cyprus has been in the media for many wrong reasons. Uh, part of that was uh, due to the high concentration of uh, Russian interest business there. Uh, and given the lack of um, clarity or transparency as to how they came initially, uh, how they grew up their businesses around the world via Cyprus, or with schemes that included Cyprus in it, uh, ranging from jurisdictions that are less uh, transparent or even more renowned, but in, in, in mixing up the structures, usually um, Cyprus would fit in that, mm -hmm. in, in, in that scheme. So, um, yes, there has been uh, quite some activity uh, with the last one, the Cyprus Confidential, last year. And uh, do, you, uh, do you want to just talk about, uh, so you just said Cyprus Confidential, which is an investigation that was yeah. published by uh, numerous media last year, looking at the role of professional enablers sure. uh, and, and their role in, in setting up companies for, for various different nefarious yeah. actors. Do you want to give us a, a brief overview of that? Yeah, uh, what I would like to say, Tom, is that um, we, at least for our institute, took it from the positive side. Mm -hmm. So it's an opportunity to rectify things, it's an opportunity to put things in place. And thus, uh, Eka said, um, the enabler, uh, I'll put it shortly, uh, is an accessory to the crime. So they should be pursued, they should be chased up and face all the consequences. So, um, yeah, and the service providers, the service providing, um, let's say, community, which includes TCSPs, as we call them, trust and corporate service providers, we are under the DNFBP's non-financial um, 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 regulators. Uh, has been excelling in Cyprus for quite for, for many years. Uh, now it came to, um, to, a, to a ceiling, I would say, or has been severely uh, monitored. Um, so our role is within this ambit. And just give me a, a minute to explain what we do as ICPAC. Probably other professional organizations do that as well. But uh, it would be easier for me to explain more uh, as we talk uh, further down the discussion and to facilitate uh, the overall discussion. Well, the Institute of Certified Public Account of Cyprus is a um, membership organization, it's a private organization, uh, numbers around 6,000 members, and we've got a um, dual role. One is being a member of um, professional body for our members, and the other is uh, being a competent authority um, pursuant to authority that has been given to us by law. So we have, uh, we are um, a competent authority for the professional activities of our members, for um, the statutory audit regime, so that's only for auditors, uh, for AML, regarding the activities of our members uh, under AML, sanctions, uh, the provision of administrative services, which is the same as TCSPs, and for insolvency uh, practitioners. Um, the two 
functions that are horizontally sanctions and AML, and they constitute a um, significant part of our monitoring activity. Um, so we've got a model, we've introduced a model, uh, a regulatory model as we call it, uh, which starts with the licensing, that is issue a license for someone to practice as a professional, as a practitioner, not necessarily, not only by being a member, but to practice, that is set up a, a firm and offer services. They need a different license for every type of um, activity. Then we uh, guide them, we train them, and we've put substantial activity on that and providing them support in delivering their work. And then it comes to monitoring. We do it in a number of ways, off-site, that is through questionnaires, receiving information, through a risk-based approach, we evaluate uh, a lot of information. And on-site, which is actually visiting the firm and getting into their records, files, etc. And the last part, depending on how the monitoring goes, we've got uh, the disciplinary part, which is broken down into two uh, streams. One is the administrative um, committee, an independent body from our organization, which looks at the findings from the on-site on monitoring visits, and the disciplinary, which um, tries cases uh, uh, for ethics, breach of ethics, accusations, uh, complaints, etc. Um, within this role as a re regulator, we've got a lot of, we, we placed a lot of uh, uh, obligations on our members. Some have been mentioned before. That is uh, because they are gatekeepers as well, the, the first line of defense. So they have to, and they are obliged to do that through. Um, uh, a directive that we issue pursuant to the law and the European directives. Uh, they are obliged to know where our client is, um, uh, record and understand the business rationale. What you said earlier about a young kid owning <laughs> that business doesn't have a business rationale. So they need to ask the questions and be skeptical on that. Uh, they need to uh, exercise due diligence, enhanced due diligence where, where it's needed, a background screening for their clients, ongoing monitor, and we request this information from them. If it, when it comes to sanctions, we want to know the true matches of the names being mentioned, uh, and also if their clients fall within sectoral sanctions and other types of sanctions. So, the, so these are all the monit monitoring and disciplinary yes, efforts. Yes. Could you outline some of the efforts more recently that your organization has made to, to really clamp down on the professional enablers of corruption? that's new yeah. compared to what you might have been doing in the past? Well, um, given the... Um, uh, we, we, we collect information from various sources. One is through our members, through the questionnaires and the information that they have to give us. The other is through media or through the announcements by the EU, the UN, um, other Western countries where sanctions uh, announcements, and we... Um, the media, uh, of course, organizations like yours, and we collect this information and we analyze them. So when we had the case, for instance, um, uh, two years ago with sanctions and the um, in inclusion in the sanctions list of the UK and the US of two um, corporate services, let's put it like that, one was a legal firm, the other was under our um, jurisdiction. Um, the case is not unknown, it's the merit service tied with the Abramovich yeah. case. Um, okay, we, we had four examination in that, with the ultimate um, result being the revocation of uh, four licenses from that firm, actually it's closed down now. Um, and uh, the ish pro problem we had to face is that we did that without having the full backing of um, the legal framework. Because um, UK and US sanctions are not part of our legislation. So we needed to find ways in order to capture wrongdoings, not necessarily being embedded in our law. And, and this was, this was um, quite a new thing, right? So the US and the UK both uh, placed uh, sanctions on not only the two uh, corporate services provided, providing firms, but their owners. Yes. Uh, what reaction did this have in the wider community among members that you regulate in Cyprus? Well, they created a havoc, I must say, a lot of fear. Uh, it complicated things extensively. Starting from the banking sector, they closed down everything. So 
Um, they, they were uh, isolated from all their businesses and probably from their estates as well. Uh, on the other hand, it showed how vulnerable uh, these people are. I mean, they were quite wealthy. They had businesses going on for 30, 40 years. Uh, so it showed that uh, all of a sudden they are very vulnerable and they, had, they, they need to be very careful in what they are doing. So it was a good message for others. When we had the um, um, Cyprus Confidential re Revelations last year, any names that were included and were related to our institute had been summoned, have been examined, and we asked for additional information, and where we saw that um, uh, they didn't perform their job as they should have done this, knowing their clients, their due diligence, even their cybersecurity systems as well. Um, some of them were referred to uh, the um, administrative committee for additional sanctions. Uh, the, uh, of, overall, we, we do in our uh, regulatory capacity um, uh, inform the FIU with SAS or STRs when we find something. Uh, we've um, given to the police around 10 cases for potential breaches of sanctions. So we go on the suspicion, not just on the actual fact. Um, we referred cases to um, the um, um, sanctions uh, enforcement unit of the Ministry of Finance as well, or where there is, needs to be some clarification. Uh, and uh, we have expedited our internal uh, regulations for, in order to be able to be, be more effective when we go forward. And something which I missed before, in order to maintain our independence and, uh, and, and enlarge the distance between the um, regular authority, that's our members and our board, the on-site monitoring activity is done by a subcontractor, which is ACCA, Association of Chartered Certified Accountants, based in the UK, probably the largest accountancy body in the world, and they carry out that task on our behalf in order to keep, uh, have a, I was going to say Chinese wall, but it might not sound so well. Uh, be, be, could be a bit corrupted, the Chinese wall, but let's say a, a, a fence between, uh, between us and our um, regular entities. Mm. Uh, the, uh, just to sum up, the overall um, um, sentiment is obviously going a bit, become a bit more regulated. Uh, we have seen uh, the interest from the government being increased in order to rectify this issue, mm -hmm. which ends up at the credibility, uh, reputation, and the fame of the country has multiple consequences going forward. So that's why we need to combat this activity, and that's why we need, apart from the actual actors that are doing what they are doing, th those that are assisting them in performing these foul functions to just and uh, Cyprus is, is an EU member state, yes. um, and we have with us uh, Chiara from, from the EU today. Um, so I want to bring you in. Uh, the EU has just introduced new measures to tackle uh, money laundering. Um, I think uh, we were discussing earlier, they were signed into the, Europe, uh, the official journal just yesterday. Um, so can you walk us through what those new anti-money laundering uh, measures are, um, wh what they will imply, and how they're, how they're going to make life more difficult for the professional enablers of, of corruption? Yeah, sure. And good afternoon, everybody. Maybe to do that, uh, let me get a bit to the source of the problem, uh, because uh, indeed um, some of the problems uh, that are related to the um, checks uh, that are done by the non-professional uh, operate, non-professional, sorry, non-financial professionals uh, have already been mentioned. Uh, and uh, the EU is a quite a special case because uh, we were a jurisdiction that enabled. Uh, enacted the FATF standards immediately, so we have these sectors in our legislation for more than 20 years. Um, let's say that uh, it hasn't been the easiest. <laughs> um, for sure, we've had problems in the financial sector. It's not coming out of nowhere, the reform that we just did. But in the non-financial sector, we had uh, quite uh, more critical um, problems, uh, and uh, they are not negligible, even if one thinks, okay, primarily you should focus on the financial sector. We were mentioning earlier the statistics we had is 
about one third of money laundering in the union can be linked to the non-financial sector. So we're really talking of huge sums, not something small. Um, where did we come from in the reform? Uh, from this understanding of challenges at very many levels. So at the level of the operators, I mean, some were mentioned, uh, but uh, you still have uh, a lack of knowledge uh, or acceptance of what it is that you have to do. Sometimes you have uh, still, notwithstanding court cases at the highest level in the union, an understanding of the scope of the legal privilege that is way beyond what should be the case. Uh, and uh, inevitably, you also have limitations in what you can do because most of these firms uh, are small. And the capacity that they have in terms of implementation of anti-money laundering measures is limited. The problem being that this is not necessarily commensurate to the risk appetite that they have. And that's where you risk becoming, from a gatekeeper, an enabler. Um, other things that we saw uh, are problems with supervision. Uh, and here, um, I mean, everybody can read the impact assessment that led to our proposals, uh, but for sure, one of the elements was this self-supervision, so self-regulatory bodies and the activities of self-regulatory bodies. It's not only a problem of self-regulatory bodies, uh, but in that case, very often we had specific situations of not even knowing who your supervisory population is, uh, not applying uh, any type of risk rating in order to focus the limited resources you have, a complete misunderstanding, again, of what is the legal privilege. Here, I'm not quoting anything that is secret. I mean, again, you can read it in the impact assessment, but I, I remember it because it was a conversation I had with one <laughs> self-regulatory body where uh, I was told that even just knowing what is the share of high-risk customers uh, or record that would be against uh, legal privilege rules. I mean, if it were the names, potentially, but the share really not. So, a lot of work to be done at the level, really, of the understanding of what your task as a supervisor is. And then, of course, we're talking of the union. So, you have all the elements of cross-border cooperation. And one of the things that was coming up was, what do you do? Because uh, even if you are a supervisor, there is a public authority, and you're in charge of the non-financial sector, sometimes you don't even know who the counterpart is in the other member state. So, Sorry for the long <laughs> scene set, uh, a quite grim one. Uh, what did we set out to do? Uh, so, the package is not the only thing. Uh, we have issued also toolkits to support, for example, the legal profession and to make them understand how they can uh, apply anti money laundering measures uh, whilst preserving the respect for what is a very legitimate element uh, of the right of defense, so the legal privilege. Um, but then we felt that, that there are things that really needed to be clarified. So, for example, the scope of this legal privilege. We cannot harmonize it. This is something that still remains with the member states, but we can clarify some things. So, if you know that you're in an active situation of enabling a crime, you cannot advocate that this is a situation that is covered by the legal privilege. So, if in that case, uh, you must report. Failure to do that uh, will mean uh, a criminal sanction, because this is aiding and abetting, and uh, an administrative sanction under anti-money laundering rules. Uh, we also asked uh, FIUs to be more proactive, to support more the risk understanding of these sectors by providing typologies, by providing feedback, in the hope, actually, that there are suspicious transaction reports that are sent uh, by these sectors. And to do that, uh, that's where the supervisory element comes into uh, play. We did actually strengthen uh, the entire element of supervision around these sectors. First, uh, real estate, uh, we could not really justify why there should be self-supervision in that sector. This is not a sector that is covered by the legal privilege in any way, so that's gone. It's only public authorities supervising the sector. When you have self-regulatory bodies, we will have a public authority that makes sure that the quality of the supervision by the self-regulatory body is 
adequate so that they actually do what they are supposed to do. It doesn't mean that, uh, and, and it shouldn't mean, that this public authority looks into individual files. That's not its job. But to make sure that you know who the entities are, that you actually do supervise them, uh, and you take measures where needed, this is the job of this future authority. And then uh, we have created a, a EU-level uh, system of support. So there will be AMLA, so the new AML authority, what the authority will do is, of course, not direct supervision of the non-financial sector, but it can uh, have indirect powers, for example, uh, through thematic reviews of the sectors, which will be coordinated by the authority through peer reviews, so that you can compare what you do and see good practices in other member states and maybe integrate them. And for example, in situations of real failure, AMLA will be able to issue warnings uh, to the entire supervisory system. This is combined with other mechanisms, for example, supervisory colleges, uh, which are not a concept so far very much um, established in the non-financial sector, but which will be possible, and we have a legal framework supporting that. So hopefully, hopefully, what we've seen so far should no longer be the case. Okay, and do you think it's going to be a game changer? Were there things that you wanted to get into the legislation that you couldn't quite manage to? What's, how, how do you see it kind of in terms of what would have been the ideal in this legislation? I think uh, it, I mean, all the tools are there. I have no reasons to believe that this cannot change. Uh, um, of course, uh, I mean, it's, it's going to be only as effective as it is implemented. So. We need uh, to have uh, sufficient resources that are put in uh, these public authorities by the member states. Uh, if this is not the case, uh, it's just a layer of control that will be meaningless. Uh, um, same thing when it comes to the supervisory colleges. Uh, it, it can really make sure that we have a common approach across the entire European Union and potentially also beyond, but it depends very much on the willingness uh, of the supervisors uh, to, to do their job. I mean, the fact that AMLA is there and AMLA is taking a look uh, gives us this level of assurance, uh, uh, but AMLA cannot be the solution to all the wrongs. So there needs to be an effort that is put by the member states with sufficient resources and really willingness to make this reform work. Okay, so the challenge has been set. Um, Justina, I want to bring you into the discussion. So um, you work with uh, Rusi and you and your colleagues recently published a, a policy brief looking at the professional enablers of, of sanctions evasion. Um, can you walk us through you know, what that report set out to, uh, to show, what your findings were? Um, can you give us an overview? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Tom. And, and thank you all for being here and braving the second building. I'm glad people <laughs> were able to find it. Um, so, first of all, just to back up for a second, I, I want to reiterate uh, why it's so important uh, to look at enablers and to target them through the tools we have available, such as anti-money laundering tools, uh, criminal prosecutions when appropriate, and sanctions, right? Targeted financial sanctions. And that's because, uh, as has already been mentioned, they serve as nodes in networks. Uh, for those of you that watch the excellent documentary that was right before here, um, I thought it was an excellent um, introduction or starter for this panel because it, it really showed all these bad actors around the globe using the same set of enablers. So there was a bank account that terrorist groups were using, drug cartels, organized crime, and kleptocrats, not because they were all friends, but because that was the enabling bank. And I know we're not here to talk about banks, but it's the same thing with professional enablers. You disable one, you can you know, disable and disrupt service for a number of nefarious actors and clients. Number two, 
is that we're talking about the flannel suit crowd here, right? These are people uh, with fancy accents, fancy clothes, fancy friends. Some of them might be or may not be in the British royal family. But these are the people we talk about there, go to high society parties, um, why, while at the same time they're also willing to represent the bad guy, turn um, the other way, you know, stick their head in the sand um, and help Russian oligarch. But they do have a reputation, right? Some people um, are beyond shaming, uh, but they do have a reputation to protect. No one, they don't want everyone at the party to know that they're representing um, you know, Prigozhin, for example. Um, so that's why it's so important, one, to do the work you, Tom, are doing and your colleagues, the OCCRP and other um, investigative organizations, is they really need to be shamed, right? That's super important. Um, but also because they do have that reputation to protect, uh, what you said, deterrence also comes in. You hit a several, their friends in the same profession will notice and they will take note and they may think twice before offering their service again. Three, it's the access to the global financial system. The kleptocrat does not conduct business in his own name most of the time he or she needs that access, and that's what professional enablers provide, and that's why we call them, obviously, the gatekeepers. So before going into the typologies we identified in the report, uh, let me give just a, a note. Um, let's not focus too much on the professions, right? Here we're talking about lawyers, accountants, trust and company service providers, but if you're too hung up on regulating lawyers and not notaries or other professions, you're gonna have gaps because it doesn't take a lawyer to set up a shell company. Lots of professional enablers can do that. So it's very important to focus on the services that are provided and making sure that people that provide these types of services are regulated properly not just going by profession by profession, because as we were talking about earlier, notaries serve a very important function in some countries, but less of an important function in others. Um, so to get into the typologies we identified, so what we did, uh, myself and my two colleagues at RUSI, Tom Keating and Eliza Lockhart, we took over 100 investigations by OCCRP, but other investive groups looking at Russian and Belarusian sanctions evasions since the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. We also looked at US, UK, and EU actions against enablers, uh, be it sanctions or criminal prosecutions, and try to come up with the typologies of their trade. And when we started putting um, our literature review together, it became extremely obvious that we were seeing kind of the same tactics over and over again. So we were very quickly able to come up with a list of the most common tactics. And I don't think they're gonna be surprising to you, but the fact that we all know this is what they do, this is what's happening, and it's still happening, is what's most troubling to me. The film earlier talked about the Yeltsin era shell companies. We're still talking about shell companies today. That's a problem, right? Anonymous shell companies. Uh, so the first uh, typology, it's what we call playing the shell game. That's setting up convoluted, anonymous shell companies, serving as nominee directors, and setting up trusts as well. Trusts are an incredibly important component of this. Um, one of the examples we give is um, the Karimov Trust. So Karimov, a Russian oligarch, he set up a Delaware Trust, uh, a famous state in the US known for incorporating companies. Um, in 2017, he's sanctioned by the US in 2018. This trust is not identified as block property until 2022. So for four years, that trust is functioning, investing in US companies because of this convoluted structure, because 
it was just very difficult to ascertain who's behind that trust. Next tactic is what we call keeping it in the family. So using family members as owners of your assets on paper, even though you continue to control them. The bad guy, the oligarch, the kleptocrat really is in control. And the example you gave at the beginning is a perfect one. We see kids being used um, as owners of very lucrative assets all the time, minor kids. Um, also seeing you know, girlfriends, uh, your bodyguards, you name it, that, you know, if it's someone you trust, you're going to make them an owner of the company and, and hopefully nothing goes badly because, uh, you know, if, if the bodyguard uh, runs off with your company, you're in trouble. But uh, again, going and having these networks of people that can be the owners on paper of your company while you are kind of, you know, the puppet master in uh, the background. And we see that all the time, and that's because, uh, you know, a lot of the time when you're sanctioning the oligarch, you don't necessarily sanction his whole family, you're not going to sanction the minor child. Um, so it's very important to identify the property that has been, for example, transferred to the child as blocked property if you're not going to sanction the child, and I'm not saying you should sanction the 11-year-old in that case, because uh, perhaps they're unwitting. Like I said, leveraging networks, we're seeing, uh, you know, the Russian sanctions evaders use a whole host of networks. Some of these uh, enablers that are helping these sanctions evaders are working with organized crime and other bad guys as well. Of course, they're investing that money in real estate, uh, lots of attention has been paid to yachts, artwork, high value real estate. Um, again, assets that you can very easily spend uh, in a short period of time, uh, as well as in, in companies. They, they buy shares, they own companies. Um, and when that gets me to really the next typology, which is making sure you own just below a certain threshold, be it a reporting threshold if you're talking about securities laws, or in the case um, of sanctions, it's owning just below 50%, like 49%, 45%. And I talk to my banker friends, I used to work at a bank, so I still talk to them a lot, and they're like, we don't know what to do because the threshold for blocking is 50%, we don't like this company, uh, we don't want, we want to get rid of them, we want to debank them, but our business guys are telling us, well, it's technically not sanctioned, it's technically not blocked because the ownership has been reduced to below 50%. What needs to happen? The US has this 50% threshold, the EU and UK also look at control. I think the US needs to change the rules to look at control as well. Shopping around. Lax, looking for lax jurisdiction. And sorry, but unfortunately, Cyprus comes up a lot, uh, as does UAE, as does BVI. None of these jurisdictions, again, should be surprising to you. Um, but we're seeing them all the time. We need to pressure those enabling jurisdictions. We all know a lot of the Russian dirty money is going to the UAE. What is being done about it? Can we somehow put more pressure on the UAE? Could the US issue a business advisory on the UAE um, to kind of alert it, uh, authorities uh, or businesses, banks and others uh, of the sanctions circumvention risks of doing business with some of these laxer jurisdictions? Of course, buying passports, you know, very common, or residency. A lot of the people we saw, um, a lot of the enablers, what they help their clients do is, you know, get a dual citizenship somewhere else so that can incorporate a company in that jurisdiction, have a bank account in the jurisdiction, buy real estate, makes everything easier. Um, slap suits, and I know this is beyond really the, the definition of 
kind of financial enablers and some of what we think of as enabling activity. But what we see is that these are full stop shops, right? Some of these firms enabling um, companies, they're willing to set up your shell company, they're willing to set up your trust, and they're also willing to sue the journalist that then exposes them in a slap suit. So it's very important to think of this as a continuum of services. So even though you may not be able to regulate slap suits through AML CFT, you need to get serious, especially the UK and other jurisdictions that are really tourist jurisdictions for slap suits that go after journalists um, for stories that have no links to the UK. Uh, it's just too easy to sue in some of these jurisdictions. Um, and finally, um, what the best professional enabler does is help you stay one step ahead of the authorities. So all this happens, the shell companies, the trusts, the putting assets in the names of family members, the th threats of lawsuits, happens before the person, the oligarch, is even sanctioned, which is what we saw with Roman Abramovich. For example, you know, on the eve of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, there was a flurry of uh, asset transfer activity. Um, because, again, they're staying one step ahead, we need to make sure we're staying one step ahead of them. And the final thing I will say before I turn over to you is that we need to think about two things. We need the regulatory framework, the right AML CFT framework, and I will say that the EU, UK, is ahead of the US on the regulatory framework, and we also need enforcement. Uh, either one without the other is not doing us any good. And the U.S., great on enforcement, but we can talk about it later, is lacking the AML CFT framework for certain types of professional enablers. It, it's had some progress, but much more needs to be done. Thanks, Justina. So, yeah, let's, let's stay with enforcement. So, um, Eka, I mean, in, when we look at the enforcement challenges um, that we have in this space, um, what, what do you see uh, as being the, the biggest challenges that enforcement agencies have for implementing mm -hmm. this stuff? Yes, so some of them I think we mentioned already before, so maybe I, I wouldn't repeat, but yeah, they're related to like building the case, building the evidence, like proving that the enabler really knew what they were doing. Uh, and to that actually, end, actually, investigative journalists' work is super important. Sometimes you get a hold of like leaked emails or are able to find some sort of connections that can also, in courts where this holds up as evidence, can, can serve that as evidence and can help build a case. Supervisory challenges were also discussed at length, and I would just add two more. Uh, first is that um, enablers are often not identified. We don't know who they are. Um, for example, when perpetrators and officials, corrupt officials from around the world are investigated and more like companies bribing foreign officials, um, investigated and held, to, held accountable, and we see the court documents or indictments or other um, kind of regulatory notices, um, you can see that there, has, there have to be several enablers involved in this case, but they're not named. Mm. Um, clearly, somebody purchased that mansion. Um, well, banks usually are named. It's easier to kind of identify them. The non-financial gatekeepers do not necessarily uh, feature. Um, and again, thanks to investigative journalists, I think we have a lot more evidence to that end. And the second challenge is also knowing what exactly they did, what exactly the service, like as Justina highlighted, it's, super, it's critical to know, it's, otherwise we're, we're talking in very vague terms, what exactly are we holding them accountable for? So knowing what exactly they did, what kind of services they provided uh, is also critical. Do you think um, in this enforcement space we need to see, I mean, earlier I mentioned an example of, uh, of the, 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 the sanctioned um, uh, firms in Cyprus and their owners, uh, and the, the individual owners were also sanctioned and named and shamed. Do you think we need to see more of this kind of thing, sort of heads on spikes, public shaming for individuals in this enforcement space? Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, however, I will definitely agree with the enforcement that was mentioned earlier. Um, it's, it's one of the issues we've got in ourselves as well, build up a case, bring it before the courts and try it. 
uh, when we discuss with the U.S. Uh, representatives that they come to Cyprus, Department of Justice, and we discuss about the regulatory framework in the U.S. versus the European, um, well, their defense is that, but we've got stronger enforcement, which is true, actually. Uh, this is something that we lack, and maybe we should be building it up uh, uh, within the EU as well. Uh, so, yeah, enforcement is fundamental. And also the shaming is fundamental. The negative publicity would uh, um, possibly do the same work as, uh, as a criminal conviction. Um, and you mentioned the example of U UAE being um, a bit of a hotspot for this kind of stuff as well. Um, I mean, if we fix these problems in the EU or in the US, um, are we at risk of just offshoring the problem of professional labors to, to other jurisdictions? Right, that's why it's, it's very important. Uh, I mean, we saw kind of the, the wealth moving from certain places after the invasion to other places, right? It's, it's not a secret. There have been a lot of exposés on, on UAE. Um, so I think we need to use, you know, all the pressure we have on these um, enabling jurisdictions. And I know the, the EU, uh, you know, might have a tool for that. <laughs> I don't know. Do you want to come in on that one, Kara? Or? Do I want to? <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, everybody knows what happened. So, yes, the UAE is still on the list of uh, high risk countries of the European Union. I think it was uh, quite a clear statement on the side of the European Parliament. Um, they rejected uh, the Delegated Act. Um, so, for the time being, yes, every transaction involving UAE remains subject to enhanced due diligence measures uh, on the side of all operators in the Union. Okay. Um, I think we've got about 25 minutes left, so I want to open it up to the audience for some Q&A. Um, does anyone have a question? Please raise your hand. Please. It's coming. Thank you. Um, my name is Penelope. I work in due diligence in London. Uh, my question is <coughs> for Justina. You made a very good point talking about proxy shareholders um, and how that aids sanctions evasion and all forms of other crimes. Um, what I'm wondering is whether you can seize assets belonging to a proxy and, you know, if there's kind of a legal foundation for that to be okay. I, I mean, I think it's difficult and that's why I use proxies, but I would imagine you would have to somehow prove that the person is, is just a proxy and who's, who's actually behind the, pro the proxy and the actual... Um, owner, controller of those assets, but that, that's why it's difficult, right? You're making l law enforcement's job uh, much more difficult through these proxies, through layering. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone else has anything to add on that. I mean, I can come in, but that's where I think the element of control yeah. becomes important. This is typically when we were discussing with the member states sanctions implementation in the context of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the typical case, what to do? Um, can we go after the wife? Uh, well, not in every case, uh, because you cannot uh, just make this link uh, and assume that control is there, but if there are elements that lead you to believe that uh, indeed the wife is just acting as a proxy, then yes, you can freeze. I mean, we're not yet at the criminal level, but under administrative measures, yes, those assets can be frozen. But it is something that's been discussed quite at length uh, and we were really going through individual cases to figure out uh, how to go about this. Well, Tommy, if I may respond to that question. Uh, when we say proxy shareholder, do we mean uh, holding a bearer share agreement or being appointed as a proxy? Because bearer share, unfortunately, there is little we can do. Uh, at least in Cyprus, it's not allowed by law. Uh, if someone represents um, a shareholder in a professional capacity, then it falls under the definition of the ASP, the, the TCSP as we uh, like to call it. Uh, that person, the, the professional, the enabler actually, uh, has to report 
for whom the shares are being held. And this license is regulated. So if should that happen, yeah, they can go back and uh, have also <coughs> consequences on the, on the enabler and also find ways to uh, freeze the assets. Um, okay, uh, any more questions? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry, you first, and then we'll go there. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, my name is Sasha Calder. I'm with uh, Publish What You Pay Canada. Uh, great presentation, and uh, I just want to reflect back a few uh, ideas because some of the stuff that's been discussed is are, are things that we've implemented in Canada. Uh, so first of all, uh, love the idea on enforcement. You absolutely need enforcement that is twinned with transparency initiatives. Um, and I, I've noticed just at the IECC that um, we've progressed from uh, talking about commitments, for instance, on beneficial ownership, now to uh, enforcement, uh, which, is, which is huge. And I think um, we need to make it harder for criminals to abuse large assets. So um, kind of talking, you know, just reflecting on what you mentioned, Justina, about how it's so difficult to go after uh, sector by sector and impose AML regulations, like on lawyers, for instance, because you're always going to get the industry associations that will lobby against you. They're much larger than us as civil society, and likely they're going to win. Uh, so going after property and uh, corporate vehicles are really important. Um, one type of corporate structure are partnerships, particularly limited liability partnerships and limited liability corporations, which oftentimes have tax sheltering and limited liability for those directors. Uh, and then finally, um, UWOs. I think that's, that's something that you can look towards Canada. Unexplained wealth orders. Yeah, unexplained wealth orders. Uh, the UK has also rolled out UWOs in Australia, and I think that'll help because if there's a reasonable grounds to suspect uh, and a court orders a, or issues a UWO, then that asset can be temporarily frozen, so they can't, it can't be divested. Bearer shares, eliminate them. We did it in Canada uh, just recently. Uh, they, don't, they don't belong. They're an archaic tool for ownership. Um, I could write a bearer share in a napkin and give it to someone, and, uh, and uh, it makes no sense in today, today with 21st century ownership and control problems. Um, and then finally, the one thing that I think is an issue is um, around family members or minors. Um, we tried to push to have a disclosure of minors uh, who happen to be the beneficial owners, but many, many countries have uh, protections for minors as part of age of consent. So I think we got to just do some creative thinking around that um, as civil society. But anyways, just, I just want to say great, great presentation and great ideas. Uh, thank you. Anyone want to come in on any of those points? Maybe just on the better shares, because mm -hmm. uh, indeed, uh, I agree, it's archaic uh, and it should no longer exist. This is one of the things we put in the package, so it's three years' time, uh, goodbye. Uh, either you register and you can know who the owner is, otherwise uh, no longer any right in the companies. Okay. On, on the family members, I just want to add, for a long time, and, and I've worked in sanctions for a long time, um, the U.S. has the ability in, in pretty much every sanctions executive order that include um, the ability to sanction uh, spouses and um, immediate family members, uh, spouses and, and adult children, in fact. Um, and they use it, but of course, they're not going to go after kind of the uh, spouse that no, is no longer talking to the person. I think they, they want some level of complicity. The minors are, are very difficult, so I think you have to get creative and in the sanctions contest if there is some property that has been transferred to a minor, uh, if you can identify that property um, and, and look at that property more closely, you know, and obviously uh, not necessarily the minor. And maybe on enforcement, if we uh, like think of like enforcement against enablers again, um, here I would like to plug the research that we recently did uh, at Transparency International and the analytical framework that we designed, which might be interesting to some of you if you're not familiar. This allows us to document uh, the specific enabling roles and behaviors uh, in, in, the, in cases. Uh, and it has been already piloted in um, two countries. 
And the third one is going to pilot it very soon. And we also um, took that framework and analyzed many of the CRP stories um, uh, from other investigative outlets as well and court documents, indictments that I was also mentioning earlier. And I would like, encourage you to uh, check it out. It's called Loophole Masters. And we didn't exactly reveal the names of enablers that came out, but um, this ex exercise actually has been very, very useful because we saw a lot of enablers consistently delivering services. Uh, incidentally, not, uh, in third countries, very often in half the times they were delivering services for foreign uh, politically exposed people, they were delivering those services abroad. So these are really interesting patterns that we uncovered and also uh, candidates for accountability work. Thanks, uh, Loophole Masters, check it out. Um, question there, yeah, we'll go one then two. Maybe we can take them t together as a pair and come back. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. I'm Roland Pop from Transparency International EU. I have a question to both Kiriakos and Kiara. Um, you mentioned, uh, mentioned self-regulatory bodies and I was wondering in your view what would be like an ideal or like a perfect self-regulatory body um, if you could describe that, and also if there is any one which already exists and it's close to that. And hi, I'm Alex from OCCRP, and my question is about enforcement priorities. Um, obviously, case selection depends on the legal opportunity and what burdens of proof there are and all that, but if you put that aside, uh, this is for Chiara, like what trends are you seeing when it comes to enabling that have you most concerned and that you think enforcement agencies should prioritize in their work because uh, they're causing the most harm or that you're most worried about them? Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, please. please. Well, do I start with the first question? The perfect self-regulatory body, well, the one that does its job. Um, <laughs> but this, I could, I could apply it also to a supervisory authorities or public body. I mean, like I said before, the problem with supervision isn't confined to the self-regulatory body. But ideally, what we would like to see is uh, exactly the same approach. So you do what you're supposed to do. You don't uh, just uh, consider that uh, you, this is not so bad. Uh, um, if there is the need to apply a sanction, you apply a sanction. If there is the need to impose a, a remedial measure, you impose the remedial measure and you publish all of that. Uh, because I do agree, this is extremely important in terms of uh, deterrence uh, for the sector. So um, is there anybody who is getting closer to that? Uh, um, I mean, I don't know, I don't want to say uh, who is good or who is bad. Uh, I think uh, in some of the mutual evaluations of the member states, you find interesting examples of self-regulatory bodies that are doing a decent job. Uh, so it's not, it's not that self-supervision per se is the problem. The problem is how you interpret your role. So as long as you do the job, let it be. I have no reasons to be against uh, self-supervision per se. Um, on uh, um, enforcement priorities, uh, I think this is more on the law enforcement side that we are looking at, right? Um, what are the priorities? I can quote uh, a very interesting report that Eurojust issued uh, and uh, for those who haven't read uh, take a look because it was almost a half commentary on our proposals uh, and uh, I think uh, there they were really nailing uh, the big problem so yes of course uh, it's uh, a lot is led by opportunities, but the problem is that if you look only at the opportunities of success, then when you're dealing with financial crime, you have very little. So one of the examples that they were quoting, and that was to really support what we proposed in terms of beneficial ownership of foreign entities that have a link with the European Union was essentially that they can continue investigations as long as they had this structure of trust companies that were in the union because they could go through the different registers, get information. The moment you hit a non-union company, it's over. So in terms of opportunities of success, you have nothing. But this is, I mean, not surprisingly, one of the most, most relevant risk areas. So of course, to me, the, the focus needs to remain on the financial thread. That's where it hurts. And what you want to do, if you really want to support the law enforcement, is to 
enable them to have access to this information. And what we did is not something that only the union can do. This is something that in the future Fatah standards require. So I mean, we just showed a possible way, I would say. So if I may also um, take the part on um, self-regulating bodies, I agree with Chiara. I mean, uh, what she said is, is true. Uh, it's reflected in um, uh, the MERs for Manival and other bodies. For instance, in Cyprus, we've got three separate authorities for service providers. Uh, one is governmental, the other two are self-regulating. And the report says that there isn't any, although it should have been better if there was one on top, but the way they operate is not creating any problems. To the contrary, it contributes to the better supervision due to the specialization each body has. However, what I would like to say, and this is what we currently consider in, in Cyprus at least, is to establish um, a supervisory national authority for service providers to start with. Our proposal as this issue was to make it, uh, to expand it to capture the whole of the financial services sector in order to uh, have better coordination between us, exchange of information, um, better typologies between each, uh, uh, with, with experiences from each uh, competent authority, without undermining, as I said, the specialization in each set. And also, which is also important for me, might not be to my benefit what I'm saying, but it is true, is to, to hold the supervisory authorities accountable if they are doing their job properly, not just the, the, um, uh, the service provider. So all of us, including the supervisory authorities, need to elevate the way we operate and render ourselves accountable, either through uh, either European mechanisms and the Council of Europe's mechanisms, or within our country. And this is something that we currently discuss, uh, Tom, with the government. It's the wish of the political will now to fix that, um, I would say, weakness we have in Cyprus. Okay. Um, do we have any other questions? Uh, yeah. Right here. Thanks. <laughs> we'll go there and then we'll go forward. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Great. Yeah, we were like totally invisible here, just like a lot of enablers. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the EU high-risk uh, jurisdiction list and the relationship. <laughs> oh, Chiara, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so the FATF updated its assessment methodology in June, July 2023, giving more attention or more weight to actual implementation and not just the theoretical framework. Um, we've often seen, for example, with the UAE, that things look great on paper, but they are not implemented. The cases of enforcement remain low. The uh, gold jurisdiction or the uh, gold sector auditing reports are not occurring. So I wanted to ask you, and this is why um, TI and the Century, which I work for, went to the parliament and advocated for not removing the UAE from the gray list, because we believe, and I think it's also in the mandate, that it should be an independent, fact-based analysis done by the EU, um, and we can't depend on a non-binding FATF body, which is great, but there are holes and, and issues. And I think, honestly, that the EU has more legal uh, tools, and, and I think we are better and have more access to data. So anyway, just wanted to get your uh, feedback on that. <laughs> what an easy question. So um, first, maybe let me clarify, uh, because uh, we are also members of the FATF, and uh, I have to say, um, for having been part also of these review uh, processes, uh, it is tough and thorough. So to get of the UK, of the FATF, you have to do a lot of job in your jurisdiction, and, and it's not limited to changing the laws. You really have to demonstrate uh, that uh, things have changed in terms of effectiveness. Um, of course, uh, in the union, uh, we are looking at uh, union-specific risks. So there was a huge discussion, uh, and I'm not going to hide that, in the context of the reform, whether we will still maintain this uh, autonomous possibility for the union to have uh, 
um, a uh, listing of third countries uh, or not. And this you can see because the position of the Council was rather not, or fully aligned essentially with the FATF. Uh, the outcome is clear. The outcome is yes, we maintain this possibility. So I think at the end of the day, the co-legislators also see the point uh, in having this flexibility. I'm not going to judge on the specific case of the UAE, like I said, I mean, Law is law, and the parliament exercises its right. So for the moment, uh, the reality is simply that UAE remains subject uh, to enhanced due diligence measures. That's it. Um, but uh, for the future, yes, we can have uh, this power exercise in situations that span also beyond what we had until now. If you look at the new rules, uh, you will see that there is a focus that is also on targeted financial sanctions and applications thereof, there will be a new methodology that is formalized uh, uh, through an implementing act in terms of how we identify autonomously third countries uh, that pose a risk to the internal market. So the idea is that, yes, we maintain the tool and we exercise the possibility of using it. If, if I can add, uh, from Transparency International, actually we welcomed this, uh, this decision and uh, we also had called uh, on the Financial Action Task Force not to delist the UAE uh, because we believe that it would be premature um, with the evidence that we have and with the information that is publicly available. Of course, we don't have access to the information on that the uh, FATF members get and the review committee get, but um, we know that, for example, investigative journalists in 2018, 2019 uncovered numerous Dubai properties owned by shady individuals in their own names, including, I don't know, hundreds, probably dozens of uh, individuals accused or um, suspected of corruption, and nothing has happened in relation to those properties. We know that the UAE is also not cooperating on um, cross-border corruption cases with uh, several countries. So based on this information and also seeing the action plan that the UAE had to sign and agree with, uh, with the Financial Action Task Force, we had doubts <laughs> that they were um, adequately satisfying uh, all, all the measures. And actually we were very pleased that European Parliament members used our letter to, uh, to yeah, keep es essentially the country on the use list. Okay. Um, we have one question here and then another one right behind afterwards. Thanks. Hi, uh, I'm Stelios. I'm a reporter at OCCRP. And um, I have a question to Chiara. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and maybe Kyriakos will also be interested to or, or, or tempted to answer. Uh, it's about the frank fragmentation of the supervision of enablers. And there have been some examples in recent years where uh, it was for European bodies to take action to take some, uh, some enablers out of circulation who have been, let's say, uh, more, no, who have created bad press, like in the case of Pilatus Bank in Malta, uh, like in the case of uh, the Russian commercial bank in Cyprus. It, it was the ECB that actually uh, pulled the, uh, the, the, the plug and not the national uh, um, uh, supervisors who were in charge of uh, supervising these bank entities um, uh, with respect to money laundering. And um, would, are there any thoughts of uh, creating uh, European bodies or agencies who uh, that, that, that would be in charge of uh, um, having a coordinating role um, in the supervision of uh, enablers Europe-wide, and uh, if need be, step in and uh, take action, like the ECB took um, in the case of these two banks. And uh, would this address the deficiencies that are, cro that, that are created by this uh, fragmentation of uh, 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 of competences among uh, uh, at, the, at the national level, um, let's say in Cyprus or any other jurisdictions in the EU that have similar models. Okay, I, I'm afraid I will have to disappoint you because the fragmentation at national level is a fragmentation at European level too. There is a reason why the ECB withdraws the licenses because it is the one responsible for that. Um, so normally, uh, and 
AML supervisor in the union doesn't have the power to withdraw licenses for the financial sector. This is something that has to be done by the prudential supervisor, and that's why you will still have these, uh, these differences in approaches. It doesn't mean uh, that you don't have uh, effective cooperation. So I don't think it needs to get to the point of the police, because uh, at the point of the police, you've already an established rogue actor that has done a lot of damage. What you want is to get a bit before, potentially, and that's why I was mentioning all the measures that we put in place in the package. Um, one thing that I didn't mention uh, is that, uh, uh, but you touched a bit on it, so, uh, is the element uh, of sanctions. Uh, and uh, actually, the entire framework until now was largely left to the member states, uh, but we will have uh, even common levels uh, of pecuniary sanctions that have to be um, uh, applies uh, that are established at European level. So there is a, a lot that I hope can be achieved uh, by the work of AMLA. I don't think indeed we need necessarily a police force if we have a strong, strong preventive um, authority. And I think AMLA, like I said in, the, in my first intervention, has all the tools to do that. So, for the law enforcement side, Europol is there and can support the work of the national police forces. So I think you cannot overcome this need for coordination, but you can use and leverage all these uh, agencies. Well, if I may uh, compliment the answer. Um, well, Stelios, you're right about the fragmentation. Uh, that there is uh, widespread fragmentation, possibly due to the special characteristics of each line of service. Uh, that's why that might be needed. The answer to your query is um, what Kara said about AMLA, which is supposed to come and be the overarching umbrella, especially for the financial services sector, as it has been uh, seen in the recent, recent papers. And um, I think it uh, what we would also like to see is a, possibly a push from the EU, from the Commission to the Member States to go for a, a harmonised uh, supervisory umbrella for all, or for all of us. And the other change that we've seen through AMLA is that uh, so far the sanctions part was not... <clears throat> what was different from the AML part. Now we are bringing them together and it's important. Because so, so far we were focusing on AML, and then different procedures for sanctions, possibly for the same person. So we need to bring them together under a, a single set of, a, a, of a responsible uh, house. And uh, go to what I've mentioned, as I suggested before, we need to establish possibly at, at, at the EU level, the EU, uh, UK has it through FCA, for instance. Possibly we could follow that example. Uh, and have at national level someone responsible to work with AMLA uh, and uh, uh, each body to do th their job as they should have done. Thanks. Um, we, did have, we did have another question, but unfortunately we're already running over, um, so sorry for that, and please come and uh, grab that at the end. Um, I think it's been a really um, interesting discussion, obviously a lot of work still to do on enablers, um, but a lot of progress as well. Uh, please join me in thanking um, our speakers this afternoon.